Uh, if we haven't met before, my name is Adam, and I'm the lead pastor here. And man, it's my privilege to welcome you here. We are excited about what the Lord is doing. We're starting a new series this morning entitled Supernatural Building. Supernatural Building. And we're looking at, for the next eight weeks, uh, the book of Nehemiah. And here's the thing about Nehemiah. Nehemiah built the walls of Jerusalem in just 52 days. Okay. So there's nothing short of supernatural. He could not have done that without God. We cannot build without God. We can think that we have these systems and we can go through and play church and build a church off of you name it, like all these strategies, church growth strategies, reach people off of... No, it is only through God and God's heart that we can build. Do you understand that, church? And so over the next eight weeks, we'll be looking at practical principles. Because how many know, just like this software that Woody's created, we need practical principles in building with God. Like he gives us those principles along the way. Amen? What I believe and what I know is that what he's doing right now in this house for this season, for this time, is that he he has given us a desire for a move of God in this house. Have you, I mean, you can just tell by the worship this morning, can you? Like he's birthed a desire to see God move in our hearts personally, but also corporately. I want to share with you this morning that, uh, I mean, I was, we pray here at 8 a.m. every Saturday morning. Uh, and you, at any point, everyone is welcome to join us 8 a.m. Saturday mornings. And uh, we pray for about 30, 45 minutes alone, just kind of, walking around and kneeling down the altars, praying. And I was walking from over here down this aisle and we were coming together about to pray. And I had a vision. Now, I I shared this last night. My wife got a little scared at first. Uh, She said, Adam, you need to explain that a little bit better before you tell. Uh, I had a vision and I saw my wife when she was nine months pregnant with my son, Caleb, and it was in August, okay? So I saw a vision of my wife, nine months pregnant, and she, and she was like, Adam, that doesn't mean we're having another baby. I was like, absolutely not, we're not, we're, we're good. Like, I'm, I'm happy, unless God does something supernatural and I'm willing to do whatever God wants to do, we're not having another baby. So um, <laughs> it's just the way it is, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> but I saw, I asked the Lord, Lord, what, is, what does this mean? What does this mean for our church? Because I know this is not just an image that came in my head for no reason, like, what does this mean? And the Lord spoke to me very clearly, and I wasn't really able. He said, I have birthed at Journey a culture of revival, a people who are hungry for the presence of God. I've impregnated them with that desire, and you were in the last trimester before the birthing happens. Like, if, I don't know if you were here last night, we had, I think it was prophetic. I remember Jacob said, hey, we want to do a worship night and, and, and call it Encounter Now. And I was like, man, I kind of wanted to change our worship nights from the waiting room to Encounter because I believe now's the time. And I think it was prophetic in nature and God brought it all together that now is the time for the encounter. No longer are we waiting, but now is the time to go in and we are encountering the Holy Spirit. Now. We're not waiting now. That's what God wants to do. And so he's teaching, he's going to teach us through this series, I believe, through these practical principles, uh, how to birth, how to build, and how to sustain revival, how to sustain a move of God. And even this morning, the principles that we're going to learn is for every season. Nehemiah was in a season, in a state of brokenness, but if we maintain that brokenness, that heart for God, and no matter what season we're in, even when a move of God comes, we'll be able to sustain it. Because what happened, we'll find out in chapter 13, we'll get there at the end of the series, is that they had one of the greatest moves of God in chapters 9 through 11, I believe. I could be getting that wrong. But chapter 13, they forsake what God had done, and they messed it all up. It's going to teach us. How many of you know we can learn from mistakes, Right? It's going to teach us how to sustain a move of God. And so let's dive into the, actually, you know what, I want to give you a 30,000 point, 30,000 foot view of the book of Nehemiah before we read. Um, The book of Nehemiah is 
Uh, yet to understand it, you really need to understand uh, the book of Ezra, which is in the chapter before Nehemiah. And what happened was the Jewish people were led into captivity by the Babylonians. And it's the story of God leading his people back to Jerusalem. And so you have the story in three different characters that we see in the story of the book of Ezra and Nehemiah. Ezra and Nehemiah were actually one book together at one point. And scholars separated them out. But in the book of Ezra, we see the, the character of Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel, he led the, uh, the, the Jewish people out of Babylonian captivity back to the, the place where, uh, where the God promised his people that they would inhabit. And he rebuilt the temple. And then you see the, char- you see, uh, the story of Ezra. And Ezra, he brought the community of people and he taught the Torah. Brought the community back together. And then we were looking at the, uh, Nehemiah as a character, and uh, he brought the people of God back out of captivity into Jerusalem, and he rebuilt the walls, and like I said earlier, supernaturally in 52 days. So let's read our text today. That's just an overarching view of what's happening uh, in this story. Nehemiah 1, verse 1. It says this, The words of Nehemiah... The son of Hakali, it came to pass in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, as I was in Shushanth, citadel, that Hananiah, Hanani, one of my brethren, came with men from Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped, who had survived the captivity and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the survivors who were left from the captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down, and its gates are burned with fire. So it was when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. Notice that phrase there. He mourned for, what, many days. I was fasting and praying before God of heaven. Now, watch what he prays. He prays this. He says, and I said, I pray, Lord God of heaven, O great and awesome God, you who keep your covenant and mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments, please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open, that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now, day and night, for the children of Israel, your servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Both my father's house and I have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept your commandments the statutes, nor the ordinances which you commanded your servant Moses. Verse 8, remember I pray the word that you commanded your servant Moses saying, now here's the promise, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though some of you were cast out of the farthest part of the heavens, yet I will gather them from here, from I will gather them from there and bring them to the place which I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. Now these are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. Verse 11, O Lord, I pray, please let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who desire to fear your name and let your servant prosper this day. I pray and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. For I was the king's cup bearer. We're going to talk about that next week. Now let's read just a little bit of, of chapter 2 right here, verse 1. And it came to pass in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Adaxerxes, when wine was before him, that I took the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had never been sad in the presence before. Therefore the king said to me, why is your face sad since you were not sick? This is nothing but sorrow of heart. I've entitled my message this morning, Break My Heart for What Breaks Yours. God, would you break my heart for what breaks yours? If you like my notes this morning, you can text notes to the number that is on the screen and what's in front of me will be in front of you. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we all came here this morning to hear from you. Lord, no one came here just to hear from me or to sing a couple songs, but we all came here to hear from you. So God, I pray that this morning you would make your logo sort of become rhema to us. Lord, your word is a lamp into our feet and a light into our path. So God, would you speak to us today? So Lord, we say to you this morning, speak for your, whole, for your, for your servant is listening. Holy Spirit, take the room. We give this to you. We give these next few moments to you in Jesus' mighty name. Everyone said amen and amen. So this past week, 
Uh, my kids went back to school. Maybe uh, your kids are back to school if you have kids. And uh, either this week or the, or, the, or the last week, and uh, they went to school on Wednesday. Tuesday night, we gathered together for family devotions. We just prayed over our kids for the upcoming school year. And I started off by asking the kids this question. So what are you looking forward to the most about this school year? And Ruth, my 11-year-old daughter, she says, uh, Dad, I'm really looking forward to seeing my friends again. I was like, great answer. That, that's, that's perfect. You're looking forward. It's not about math or science. You know, I wasn't that way either. I'm looking, you're, you're looking forward to seeing your friends. Cool. I asked my son, so, so Caleb, what, he's, 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 uh, he's, he's 10. I asked him, uh, so what are you looking forward to uh, about this school year? And he says to me this. He goes, leaving school. <laughs> and I said, uh, okay, okay, buddy. So uh, how about something else? And he looks at me with a grin on his face, and he's trying to be funny. I know that, but he's being serious all at the same time. And he says to me, uh, I'm looking forward to recess, Dad. And I said, okay, third time, buddy. Uh, give me something else. What are you looking forward to about the school year? And he said, lunch. <laughs> this is what I know about my son. He doesn't have a heart for school. Like, he doesn't really care. Now, does he do well in school? Absolutely. He does. He's a smart kid. He does really, really well. But I know that because of that, Laura and I, we have to stay on top of him. Hey, do you have any homework today? What's going on? Like asking him questions to make sure he does well. Because he's smart. He maybe he just doesn't apply himself because he doesn't have the heart for it. Right? In order for you to have a resolve, in order for you to have perseverance, God has to give you a heart for it. When I was 16 years old, I encountered God at the altar for the, for, for the first time in really my adult life. And I gave my heart over to the Lord. And it was in the middle of a worship service. And God called me in that moment to be a worship pastor. And I was a worship pastor for 17 years for, before stepping in this position. And I remember along the way, Early on, 17, 18, 19, 20, like in really the entire, like whenever I saw videos of people or saw people encountering God through music, encountering God through worship, I literally, I'd just start crying and bawling because I knew that their life was being wrecked. And I would just pray to the Lord, Lord, give me a heart and a desire, God. Lord, would you, would you, would you move in me like you moved in that person to see? Because I know that only God can do it. Only the Holy Spirit can do it. So Holy Spirit, move in me because I want to create experiences and encounters with you like that. And my heart would break for what broke the heart of God. Nehemiah here. In chapter 1, his heart broke for his city to go rebuild the walls. It says this in verse 4. It says, so it was when I heard these words that I sat down and I wept and mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Notice there many days. Say many days. Many days. How many is many days? <laughs> is, is it three days? Is it five days? Is it seven? Like what does it mean here in the text? Is it two weeks? Is it a month? Is it two months? So we look here in verse 1, it says, in the month of Kislev. So Kislev is, in the Jewish calendar, is in mid-November to December. And then in chapter 2, verse 1, which is why we read it, it says in the month of Nisan. Nisan is in March to, to mid-April. So it was four months that Nehemiah was breaking for what broke the heart of God. He was waiting to go rebuild the walls. How did he wait? He waited with prayer, he waited with fasting, and he waited with, a, with mourning, with a broken heart. Lord, send me, I have to go. I have to take care, God, of my people, of your people. His heart was breaking for what broke the heart of God. He was in the waiting. None of us like to wait, do we? Have you ever had to wait on something before? It's hard and difficult. Maybe you're in traffic. You don't want to wait anymore. You're in Blanding Boulevard. I was having to wait yesterday in line. I mean, come on, Jesus, like move the traffic out of the way. This is crazy. Maybe you're, you're like my wife and you're nine months pregnant in, the, in, the, in, in August. Like that's not easy either, right? Like in the middle of summer, last trimester, that's not fun. But on a serious note, maybe you're waiting for a job promotion that you know God wants to give you. Or maybe you're waiting for a prodigal to come home, maybe a son or daughter who doesn't know God, or maybe you're waiting for a loved one who doesn't know Jesus to come to the realization of his love 
Nehemiah was in the waiting church. He was in the waiting. Nehemiah, before he had a conversation with the king to go rebuild the walls, he was waiting while God was giving him the heart for his assignment. This took four months. Four months of prayer, fasting, and a season of mourning is not easy. I would like to submit to you this morning that Nehemiah, there's no way he would have been successful without this four months of waiting while God was breaking his heart for what broke his. There's no way he would have been successful without the waiting as God broke his heart And I would like to submit to you as well that God was giving him the strategy to build the wall supernaturally during this season. He was giving him the strategy so that when he went to go step into that role, he was able to do it. You can't just go and just try without strategy, can you? And just hope it turns out. God was giving him a strategy and a resolve, so that when he faced trials, when he faced difficult moments as he built the walls, he was able to handle those difficult moments because he waited, and his heart broke for what broke the heart of God. And so he was able to persevere. You see, you can be called by God, but not sent. You can be called by God, but not sent. Nehemiah, when he heard the news of the walls being ruined, he felt called to rebuild the walls immediately, but God had not sent him yet to go rebuild the walls. David was called to be king as a shepherd boy, as a young shepherd boy, but he was in the waiting. Joseph was called to rule at the age of 17, and he finally ruled by the age of 30. Abraham waited for the promise of his son for 25 years. Moses and Caleb and Joshua waited for the promised land for 40 years. Job waited through suffering for God to restore what he had lost. Daniel waited through prayer and fasting for his promise. Church, you can be called but not sent. Say this with me. You can be called but not sent. Say it again, I can be called but not sent. One more time, a little louder, come on. I can be called but not sent. Listen, the waiting to fulfill the call shapes your character to fulfill your destiny. The waiting to fulfill the call of God on your life shapes your character to fulfill the destiny. If we walk into our calling prematurely because we forced it, we try to make it on our own, what happens is we'll be walking to our, in, our, in our calling without the character to back it up. You see, in the waiting, God is creating character in us. He's creating resolve. He's doing a work in us so that when we walk into what God is calling us to walk in, we can handle it. For us corporately as a church, he's putting us through certain things so that we can handle a move of God so we don't think it's about us, but we'll only give him the center of attention because it's about him. That's it. Church, you can be called but not sent. Church, you can have a heart but it not be God's timing. Church, it's the waiting and the preparation, which is incredibly difficult, that prepares you for your destiny. Nehemiah waited four months before he ever talked with the king. We get a glimpse of how he waited to walk in his calling in verses 5 through 11. Got really loud all of a sudden. (laughs) That was the Holy Ghost. So I want, to give you, uh, I want to give you three ways this morning. I want to give you three ways. Is my, there we go. Okay, we're back. I want to give you three ways this morning that Nehemiah waited. And we find uh, the way he waited in verses 5 through 11. So here we go. You ready? Come on, say here we go. Yeah. Number one, and I kind of changed this. You know, the Lord, the Holy Spirit <laughs> told me to change it last night. I was, I was going to say, in the season of waiting, stay in a posture of worship. But the Holy Spirit corrected me. In every season, we need to stay in a posture of worship. So here's number one. In every season of life, stay in a posture of worship. In the waiting, on the mountaintop, whatever season you're in, in order to sustain the move of God, in order to walk in the calling, what do we do? In every season of life, stay in a posture of worship. You know, my last church, I uh, went through some disappointment, and it it was incredibly difficult. I waited for two years for God to really bring me into uh, 
to journey, to be honest with you. And, uh, but the Lord gave me Psalm 27, verses 13 through 14, while I was waiting. And he said this, it says this, um, I would have lost heart unless I believed I'd see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. That God was bringing me into the, my promised land, the place where God had me. I would have lost heart unless I believed I'd see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. In one translation it says, wait on the Lord, exclamation point. God was telling me to wait. What was I doing as I postured my heart in the waiting? I, was, I dug in and I began to worship God. I just tried to live a life of worship in the middle of the brokenness, in the middle of the hurt, in the middle of just things not turning out the way I thought they should turn out. I positioned my heart of worship before the Lord. Nehemiah, that's how he positioned his heart. He said this, and I said, I pray, Lord God of heaven, O great and awesome God. It doesn't say, O great and awesome me. I have a great calling in my life. I'm going to do awesome things. I know you're going to call me. I know you call me to go build the walls of, of the city. I have an incredible purpose. No, he says, I'm not awesome, but who's awesome? God, you are awesome. You are good. You, you who keep your covenant and mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments. You know worship connects you to God like nothing else? Worship is a pathway to the presence of God. David, while he was king, he had everything he could possibly ever ask for. While he was king, he said this in Psalm 73, whom have I in heaven but you? I've got nothing on the earth I desire beside you. My flesh and my heart may fail me, but God is the strength of of my heart. There is nothing else. He knew there's nothing else. He had everything he ever wanted. He was saying, there's nothing else I desire on this earth besides you, God. That's the posture that we have to take in every single season of our lives. And he writes this and he says this, it is good to be near God. You see, because of his posture of worship, he was near the Lord. He was near God because of his posture of worship. James 4.8 says this, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Isn't that good to know? <laughs> As we draw near to God, he draws near to us and we love that part of that passage. Draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. Like, man, if I draw near to God, he's going to come near to me. Like, does that really ring in your heart? Do you understand that? Like, if you draw near to God, he's going to meet you where you're at. But watch this next part. It's a little bit sobering. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. And purify your hearts, you double-minded. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and who? He will lift you up. It's not you. It's not your talents. It's not your giftings that God's given you. God will lift you up, which leads me to point two. In every season of life, ask God to search your heart and purify your motives. Nehemiah 1 it says this, please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now, day and night, for the children of Israel, your servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Both my father's house and I have sinned. We've acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, nor the ordinances which you commanded your servant Moses. Do you see Nehemiah's in this moment? his humble heart for repentance. Even though he had a great calling, even though he had a great purpose, he humbled himself before God. His pride wasn't in himself. Who was it in? It was in God. A, her, a humble servant leader looks at his own heart first and asks God to search him. Lord, would you search me? Lord, would you search me? Sometimes we're like, man, God, you need to get a hold of that person. You need to, Lord, would you search that person? That person over there, man, they, they don't have a good heart. Listen, God is the only one that can look at the heart. He is the only one that can judge a man's heart. You cannot judge a man's heart. Take the plank out of your own eye. Stop judging others. And ask God just to search your heart because if your first thought is, God, you need to go search that person. God, to go take care of that person. They're off base. They're, they're doing all, they don't have the right heart, the right motive. 
then there's something wrong with your relationship with the Lord. There's, a, there's some pride issues there. This is what David writes. He says this, Psalm 139, search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me. Lead me in the way of everlasting. Lord, search my heart. Can you just say that right now? Lord, would you search my heart? Lord, would you search my heart? Lord, search our hearts. Let, us, let our hearts be after you. Break our hearts for what breaks yours, Jesus. Point three this morning, if in every season of life, stand on his promises. In every single season of life, while you're in the waiting, while you're on the mountaintop, while everything is going well, stand on his promises. Nehemiah 1, remember I pray, verse 8, remember I pray the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though some of you were cast out, to the farthest parts of the heavens, yet I will gather them from there and bring them to the place which I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. Nehemiah, he stands on the promises of God. His promise was this, if the people of God follow the ways of God that he gave Moses, then he will bring the people of God back together. No longer will they be scattered. That was the promise that he was standing on. So as we study this book, we will see that as the Jewish people begin to walk in obedience to God, God gives them what he promised. There have been so many prophetic words about a move of God inside of this church, but it starts with us personally, in personal obedience before God, that we would walk in holiness, that we would hate sin, that we would hate our sin, that he would give us such a dissatisfaction for our sin. Because when we walk in holiness, that's when we will see what God has promised us on a personal level and on a corporate level. But if we turn our hearts towards the things of this world, God doesn't have to hold his promise. It's as we are obedient to him. Lord, would you search me? You know, God's promises are good as done if we walk in obedience. And it's powerful to stand on the promises of God. 2 Corinthians 1.20, for all the promises of God in him are yes. Say yes. yes. And in him, amen, to the glory of God through us. To the glory, it's for his glory, y'all. It's not our own. Our lives is for his glory, not for our recognition, not for pleasing man, not for looking good, not for anything else but just to please God. That's all it is for. It is for his glory. So I encourage you, when you're going through a season of waiting and in every season of life, do three things. Find a scripture to stand on the promise of God. Write it down and remind yourself daily of God's promise. In the book of Nehemiah, we see that uh, those people, they experience a move of God. One of the greatest moves of God is what we read in Scripture. And that's what really the Lord is calling this house into. Revival takes work to happen, and it takes work to keep it. A move of God takes work to happen and work to keep it. We are in a seasoned church of building now. We are now in a season of supernatural building. Who's here and is saying, man, I want to build for the kingdom of God? Come on, do you want to build for the kingdom of God? Lord, we want to build for your kingdom, not our own. We're not building our own kingdom. We're not trying to look good or anything else. We're building for his glory and for his kingdom. I was reading a book this past week, and they gave a, a really great definition of revival I want to share with you. It said this in the, in the book, revival is sustained presence and power of God that results in transformation. We need our city transformed by the power of the gospel for the glory of God in our generation. That is our mission, and that is what we're going to do as we fulfill our vision. Our vision 
to build a community of people that is life around the presence of God. So while you were waiting and in every season, Nehemiah had to wait four months to even begin what God was calling him to build supernaturally. So while you're waiting, you worship. In every season, you worship. In every season, you ask God to search you. In every season, you stand on the promises of God. And then you will see God work through you to build supernaturally, like he built the wall supernaturally through Nehemiah, his servant, in just 52 days. Would you rise with me? We all have a part to play in the kingdom of God. He's birthed in this church a desire for a move of God. He's called each individual to play their part in the kingdom of God, to build. He's given each person giftings and talents that are different than other people There's no reason to say, man, my gifting and talent is better than the other person or, man, I'm walking in this. No, no, it is all great and it's all for whose glory is all for God's glory, not your own. And now is a season for us as a church, as we walk through this, um, this book, we discover practical principles to build supernaturally. And why is it supernatural? Because it's not us who does it, it's God. That's it. But it starts with us having a heart for whatever God's called us into. It starts for us to have a heart for our city. So I simply just want to pray this prayer with you. Would you just shut your eyes? Keep this extremely simple right now. Lord, break our hearts for what breaks yours. On a personal level and corporately, oh God. Lord, would you break our hearts for what breaks yours? Would you just say that right now? Lord, break my heart for what breaks yours. Come on, it's a powerful prayer to pray. It's something that you have to mean. Can you just say it again? Lord, break my heart for what breaks yours.